sickness, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Poverty, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Unemployment, I bind you. Marital stress, I bind you. That devil and that spirit of lust, I bind you up in the name of Jesus. Devil, I bind. Wait, wait, dude, what in the world are you doing? Dude, why are you interrupting my prayer? What does it look like I'm doing? I'm binding the devil. I'm binding all these things that are coming against me. What are you talking about? You can't just bind and lose stuff like that. Like, it doesn't work oh, like Oh, really? That. Okay, so you think you know everything. Okay, so Mr. Know-it-all, since you know everything about prayer and binding and loosing, why don't you tell me what I'm supposed to do? Okay, let me break it down for you and all the people that are watching your video. Okay, so at some point, I'm sure you have been familiar with the terms binding and loosing. These are two words that are thrown around a lot in prayer, in particular circles. And the question is, what does this actually mean? When people say, I bind this or I loose that, where are they getting this from? What are they doing? And what does the Bible actually teach about binding and loosing? Now, this idea of binding and loosing actually comes from a couple of passages in the book of Matthew. The first one we're going to look at is Matthew chapter 16. And then towards a little bit later in this video, we'll look at the second passage, which is in Matthew chapter 18. Now, Matthew 16 says this. It says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, I'm going to get to this, but before we do, it's helpful for us to understand how a Jewish first century believer would understand the terms of binding and loosing. And so they would understand that this idea of binding really refers to forbidding something or tying something up or binding something or restricting something, whereas loosing is just that. It's loosing or it is allowing something, right? And so that's how they would understand these terms. Now, I'm gonna give you several things to consider as we really try to figure out what does it mean to bind and loose. And the first thing that I want you to consider is the Greek construction of this particular verse. Because this, my friend, is where a lot of people get it wrong. Some people will interpret it in this way and they'll say, you know what, it says right here, it says, whatever you bind on earth, God will bind in heaven. And whatever I loose on earth, God will loose in heaven. And it sounds on the surface, just a cursory reading that we are in control that whatever I decide to bind on earth, and God is now obligated in heaven to back me up and to also bind it in heaven. And whatever I choose to loose on earth, well, God said, if I loose it on earth, he's going to loose it in heaven. And so therefore, I'm in control, similar to like a 401k program, right? If I put this much in, then my company is going to match it. But if I don't put that much in, my company's not going to match it, right? So the question is, is that really what this is saying? I don't believe so. Because if you really study the Greek construction of this, it sounds a little bit more like how the New American Standard or other versions of the Bible actually put it. Let's read it in the New American Standard. It says here, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Now, looking also at the Christian Standard Bible, it says this, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. So the idea here, if we're really staying true to the Greek text, is that whatever we are binding and loosing, and which we'll talk about that in a moment, just hang on with me, is already something that God has already bound in heaven or God has already loosed in heaven. And now we are just catching up and we are just putting into motion on earth that which God has already ordained or decreed in heaven. Now to use a famous Tony Evans illustration, let's just say that a football coach challenges a ruling that a referee made on a football field. The referee is not quite sure of what the proper ruling should be. So they then get on the phone and they call New York or they call the rules committee. And then the rules committee takes a closer look at this thing and says, you know what? This is overturned or this is should be uh, upheld. And so now the referees go and put in place on the football field what was already ordained or decreed 
by the rules committee in New York. And that's basically the idea of binding and loosing, right? We're not in control. God is saying, I've already bound something. I've already loosed something. You and I now need to carry that out and bind it and loose it on earth because it's already been bound and loose on heaven. Now, the second thing that I want you to consider is the context of the passage. You've heard me say this before. Anytime you take the text out of context, you're going to get conned. I don't want you to get conned. So we're going to take a look at the context and we're going to see if anything in this context is really talking about demonic uh, presence or casting out devils or demons or anything like that. Okay, so let's take a look at it. It says here that Jesus will give Peter the keys to the kingdom. Now, just as an aside, the Catholic Church will interpret this as saying, you know what, Peter was the first pope and uh, Jesus was clearly giving Peter control or authority over the church. And so therefore, all successive popes have that same level of authority and control over the church. We won't get into that. But I just want you to know that is one of the ways that many Catholics will interpret this particular verse. So it says here that he's going to give Peter the keys to the kingdom. Now, what is a key? A key is nothing more than something that opens a door, right? And so most scholars believe that basically when Jesus was saying, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, he was saying, hey, Peter, I'm going to give you the authority through your preaching of the gospel to open up the doors of the kingdom to those who need to know Christ. So that's pretty simple based on our first principle, right? Because the gospel has already been loosed from heaven. God already wants people to hear the gospel. So what are we doing on earth? We're simply loosing on earth the gospel, opening up the keys to the kingdom, something that God has already loosed in heaven. Now let's take a look at the broader context outside of this one verse. So if you look at the broader context, Jesus basically asks his disciples a question. And he says, hey guys, you guys have been listening to all the gossip. You've been out there in the streets. Who are people saying that I am? Like, what are people saying about me? And then so they say, well, some people think that you're Elijah. Some people think that you're a prophet. Some people think that you're John the Baptist. Some people think that you're like Jeremiah. And then Jesus, okay, 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 I hear you. I hear about all that. But who do you all say that I am? Who do you believe that I truly am? And Peter rises up and says, Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Whereas Jesus replies and says, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but has been revealed to you by God in heaven. And he says, because of that, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven or have been bound in heaven and so on and so forth. Now, I want you to tell me, is there any sort of talk in this passage about Binding and loosing the devil, demonic influence, poverty, cancer, unemployment, marital stress, and all these other things that people use this particular passage to bind and loose. It's not saying anything about any sort of demonic spiritual warfare anywhere in the text. The context of this is about the kingdom of God. Now, the third thing that I want you to consider is that nowhere in the rest of the Bible are we as believers encouraged or commanded to bind up the devil. As a matter of fact, there's not even any examples of people in the Bible binding the devil. As a matter of fact, in the book of Jude, which is only one chapter, verse nine, it says this, but when the archangel Michael contending with the devil was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, if the archangel Michael did not even believe that he had the authority to bind up the devil, then who are you and I to think that we have the authority? Let me just, just think about this for a second. How could we think that we have the authority to tie up or bind up the devil? right? Like God has not given us or anyone that particular authority. God is the only one that can do that. So stop binding the devil, right? Stop trying to tie him up and bind him up and put him under your feet and all those things. It's just not biblical. Now, the fourth and final consideration is what does the rest of the Bible have to say about this idea of binding and loosing? Now, this is one of the most basic principles of proper interpretation is to let scripture interpret scripture. So anytime you come across a passage that is a little bit unclear, it's a little bit obscure, don't rush to form a theology on it and start practicing something that might be false. Rather, ask yourself the question, what does the rest of the Bible have to say about this? Because oftentimes those scriptures can help shed light on what the unclear scripture is actually saying. And... 
thankfully there is also a couple of chapters down the road in Matthew chapter 18, another reference to this idea of binding and loosing. So once again, let's take a look at the context and see if we can see of any clues about binding and loosing in Matthew chapter 18. It says right here, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention even to the church, now watch this, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will have been, past tense, bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will have been, past tense, loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Now it seems from this context that Jesus, who is now talking to his apostles and not just Peter, and also by extension, the local church, is basically talking about church discipline. He's talking about how you handle somebody who is unrepentant and not cooperating. Here is a brother who you're trying to win over. They are not cooperating and they're not listening. You bring them to the church. The, uh, they're not listening to two or three people. You bring them to the church. And so they're basically rejecting and rebelling against church discipline and they're not willing to repent. And so because of that, the Bible says here that, hey, I've already bound this person in heaven and I'm giving or transferring authority over to the church leadership to be able to bind this particular person, which would be consistent with this idea of binding means, uh, you know, the keys of the kingdom, opening doors, closing doors. So this idea of binding is to lock someone out, right? Not permanently, but at least until they repent. As a matter of fact, one commenter says this about this passage. He says, it is the duty of the church as a whole and as represented by those who by the Lord have been appointed to rule over it, to bind, that is to forbid violation of these principles and to loose, that is to permit whatever is in harmony with them. The right of exclusion or excommunication from the church and upon repentance of readmission into the church is implied. It is for this reason that Jesus, speaking now in the plural and referring to the apostles as a group, these men in turn representing the church, repeats what he had previously in chapter 16, verse 19, said in the singular to Peter. Now, with all of this being said, it sounds on the surface that you might be thinking, hey, Brother Allen, don't you believe that we as believers have power? Yes, of course I do. I believe that we have been given power from God to do certain things that we wouldn't be able to do in our own strength. All I'm saying in this video is that these verses aren't the ones that I would go to to try to prove or suggest that we as believers have supernatural power. Because clearly I just showed you that the context is not talking about binding up the devil. It's not talking about loosing prosperity over your life, loosing health and all these other things that we hear people say. I would probably point to another scripture like Acts 1.8. For you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses, first in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the remotest parts of the earth. See, that talks about the believer having power because of the context. So I would love to hear your thoughts. What do you think about binding and loosing? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Let me know in the comment section below and let's talk about it. If you found this video helpful in any way, feel free to share it with a friend. Also, if you haven't done so already, I would love it if you would subscribe. Check out some of the other videos on this channel. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on The Beat. Thank you for watching to the end. I am Prophetess Alia. I hope that you are liking and commenting and subscribing to this channel as well as to Alan Pear. His channel is a very good channel to go to. I think he's a good YouTuber and creator. Please like and subscribe and I will talk to you real soon. Be blessed.